And so here we are. Hey, everybody. Welcome to, we're already living in a new time. And uh, this was sort of a spontaneous uh, article series that came together alongside the Perspectiva Temporix Month. And here at Mutations in the Substack, it's kind of always Temporix Month, if you frame it that way. So uh, I figured it would be nice for us to get together answer some more questions, deep dive a little bit around the philosophy of time, consciousness of time, uh, answer any questions about Gepser's work, particularly for those of you who are new to Gepser, especially. Uh, there are some new readers that had some really good questions and comments and even critiques uh, that I would love to be able to just address and explore with you. Um, but before we go into the Q&A, maybe we could do a brief recap of what we were talking about in in the article or what I was talking about. So it's this sort of like pithy, challenging question, right? Like we can't talk about the meta crisis. We can't talk about emergent worldview without talking about a new consciousness of time. And that this new consciousness of time is a kind of, in the words, words of Charles Taylor, uh, a background experience that suffuses everyday life. And it's already something that's a part of our everyday lives in a way that is nearly universal. And it's a strange way that the universal kind of creeps back into our postmodern experience through the experience of the climate shift, through the experience of universal destabilization and the collapse of a uh, very material um, and very specific reorientation reor towards time and space that's been sort of uh, running the planet for the past few hundred years in the modern era. So the collapse of that is also the inverse of it sort of shadow or negative version of it is giving us an image of the emergent planetary culture as well. So we can kind of look at where things are falling apart to get a sense of what's emerging. And, and that's kind of the, the point I'm making in this series. Uh, and again, pre-ontological in the sense that it's a background experience. Um, it's also a Heideggerian term, uh, uh, this pre-ontology. And I like that because it, it adds a level of um, accessibility that I think if we are too emphasizing, particularly in like meta modern circles, et cetera, of a stagist orientation, right? A stagist model where everyone has to kind of get to a particular level of thinking in order to understand what's going on. I don't think that's necessarily the case. We have the ability, and I, I would hope that we would have the ability in our circles to begin to sense into the, the ways in which there's a collective shared new experience that's going on. Um, and Yes, there's some more rarefied ways of understanding it. And I think that's what the article series is going into. For instance, you know, this new relationship with time, which is a little weird, the, the kind of ever presence of the past and the future in the present, the ways in which, you know, fossil fuels that are burning layer time or, or deepen time and entangle us in the activities of our recent ancestors, number one, and then number two, even further back, going way, way back to, you know, just using the fossil fuels. So we have to have this kind of evolutionary time that's also being drawn up into the present. Um, there's also a sense in which the burning of fossil fuels in our present is affecting uh, the future generations too, and so the unborn. So there's this weird time entanglement that's going on in, in our everyday lives, just with the particular presence of a strange series of storms or extra rainfall or strange temperatures for our time of year, um, ecosystem effects as well. But the climate and temps, this is something Andreas Malm brings up in his book, In the Progress of the Storm, uh, climate and temps. Temperature is a very interesting word for, or temp is a very interesting word for climate because it means two things. It means both the weather, but it also means temperature and it means time. So there's this entanglement in time, meaning something that has a quality again, right? And it's not necessarily a quality that we find to be um, a good one, right? It's, it's sort of anxiety inducing. Time brings in this quality of uh, solastalgia or anticipatory grief. Time brings in the sense of the weirdness of weather, right? But it's also bringing back the weather. It's bringing back forms of time as quality rather than just mere clock time. So that's sort of one of these examples of that kind of the, the negative image of the futures being uh, is showing up in the destabilizations and the sort of chaotic flux that we're all dealing with today. So planetary thinking, I mentioned this in the article as well, right? Um, climate, ecology, complexity, uh, the new worldview, right, is all of us are being owned by it, but none of us 
own it, right? Or all of us are being moved by it, but none of us own it. Um, one of the examples is, uh, you know, I, I think we have a few examples of like science fiction literature that really dives into this. Uh, I think a half-built garden is a very good example. I think Ruth Emrys is, is, is the author's name. Uh, there's A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. And uh, more recently as well, there's The Actual Star by Monica Byrne. I think these are really good examples of science fiction eco-literature um, that we can begin exploring. Um, so what I think I'm saying in the article when it comes down to it is the work that we really need is work that actually identifies some of these underlying themes and, uh, and characteristics of this emergent worldview, right? And then I think we need a lot more experimentation with this, uh, a lot more experimentation with these characteristics. How can we engage them pedagogically? How can we enact them socially, right? Gesturing vaguely towards mystified emergent processes and saying, well, something's emerging, something's emerging is, is fine. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good place to begin, but, I personally get frustrated when we sort of leave the conversation there and not actually touch on what is present in the present, what is being worked on, you know, in terms of what's working on us in the present. So I also made a, a discernment in that first article, right, between epistemic humility on the one hand and then mystification on the other. And I have nothing, there's nothing wrong with mysticism. I write quite a bit about that in, in my Substack as well. But I think mystification, I'm using that in this, in this context, is a kind of hand-waving or gesturing vaguely towards emergent processes without really wanting to touch on them or be uh, affected by them, right? Because they would mean something genuinely transformative for us in our present. And I don't know if we're all ready for that, right? I think there's a particular challenge here when we uh, touch into this pre-ontology and touch into the ways in which this emergent worldview is beginning to challenge our ways of thinking and being in the world. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the good examples for this is, uh, you know, not just the pedagogical tools that might help us like learn, dif think differently with time and complexity, but also uh, having a clear sense of our long-term thinking, right? And uh, homo curans, right? So there's a historical consciousness which comes along with this worldview that recognizes a, a deep time awareness, right? That the present is necessarily involved in um, and we that we necessarily need in order to navigate towards a, ha a habitable future. Uh, the ways in which historically we've made and remade ourselves, both politically and economically, our relationship with time and space and self uh, identity have gone through these series of transformations in the past. Having an awareness that we've done that before can help us both uh, understand the ways in which we're constricted today by those same forces, and then also how we might be able to begin transforming them. But we need tools to help us with that, right? Uh, these are both, uh, I, I would say this characteristic, if I were to name it, is a both a tool in the sense that it's, a, it's access to a plasticity of cultural imagination, right? Uh, it's both what's necessary, but then also it's a feature of the emergent worldview, this plasticity and characteristic transparency of our social institutions, our relationship with the more than human, right? Our relationship with past and future. Uh, but we can't have this transparency or this plasticity without recognizing that the sort of main theme that I'm talking about here with the emergent worldview is a new temporal imaginary, a new consciousness of time. Uh, as Shreka Horvach talks about, you know, we need a time beyond progress. And if that doesn't exist, we need to work on inventing it. A time that's compatible with a kind of Gaian realism. The realism of our uh, watersheds, for instance, is, is, is a good way of thinking about that and rooting that into your relationship with present and place. Um, so generally speaking, then I think I'm arguing for uh, the construction of a new temporal imaginary as, as our kind of project and our initiative here. Uh, we also need to reframe our role a little bit, right? So remember the epistemic humility. So uh, this is something I don't think I wrote too much about in the, in the article, but I think uh, we need to be careful with the kind of heroism or savior complex that a lot of us may hold in these subcultures, right? As if we have all of the answers, uh, or as if we're, we're kind of doing the valorous heroic work of kind of figuring it all out. 
um, the kind of changes that I think this new worldview are exhibiting or sort of emphasizing are um, much more diminutive in, in many ways, right? They're much more akin to Samwise Gamgee and the Lord of the Rings, right? Working towards planting things and growing things and restoring a relationship with places that have been, um, uh, their relationship have, has been severed in some way and has to be restored. You know, there's a gardening emphasis with Samwise. So I think he's a good example. And the fact that he's a hobbit too, there's a kind of um, a diminutive uh, uh, smallness, which is a greatness that I think is, is uh, one of the characteristics here. So all this to be, uh, to, to kind of sum up, uh, we need a temporal imaginary that holds the promise of a different kind of futurism, right? One that hopefully helps us reclaim time from progress, number one, and then two, reclaim, reclaim futurism from techno-futurism, right? As I wrote about in the, in the article, we need a kind of temporal imaginary that knows how to talk about how to live after the techno-modernist dream has ended, right? And it already has. And I think in part two of the series, I, I go into this a little bit um, more explicitly. And just in this section that I'm writing about, you know, if we're being moved by this new and ancient guy in realism, then our task seems to be to turn this into a more conscious creative relationship rather than an unconscious one where we're being destabilized by these new themes. How can we turn towards these new characteristics in a more constructive way rather than destructive, work with this guy in realism? And by doing, by doing that, I'm talking about producing works of art and imagination that foster these new futures. Um, I'm talking about, you know, Bifo Berardi's term, future abilities, right? Uh, this is an epistemic and a pedagogical activity, right? Uh, and these are very instructive towards instilling new subjectivities in us, right? Uh, new regenerative cultural practices that Daniel Christian Ball talks about. Um, and I also mentioned this too, right, to kind of get to the point about the sort of radicality in the present, if we really begin to look at it, I think uh, I mentioned this in sort of the Q&A section of part two uh, with Mark Fisher's psychedelic reason. There's a way in which, you know, I think the countercultural elements of our communities can be uh, situated in a more constructive and healthy way, right? And Mark Fisher was drawing from Spinoza's work and talking about this, you know, healing of the individual, right, happens through the distribution of responsibility in the collective, right? The diagnosis moves beyond the individual and back towards a social context. And the healing journey then becomes synonymous with the social transformation and material transformation. So I think connecting those dots is very important for us if we're not going to just create health and wellness retreats and, and sort of uh, escape back into orbit uh, and away from the kinds of immediacies that uh, this new worldview is challenging us to begin to live and enact, right? You must change your life, as Rilke says. Um, and then part three, right, just to kind of sum up some of the, those themes, I think it was just much more of a, a poetic attempt to kind of get to uh, the, the, the imagination of, of, of this new temporality, right? Um, and some of the key, key factor, characteristics of time and space and identity that I only just briefly touched on in that, in that article. Um, so I described it as a kind of planetary mentality and that it weaves this more complex relationship with past, present, and future, ancestors and unborn, and of course, living systems that are not just systems. Uh, but it also articulates a different sense of self and a different place of agency, right? Agency is not just on the individual end. There's, there's now a kind of a recognition of a transparency between the self and the more than human and the self in the social context, the self and as Simon, um, what's his name? Gosh, I'm just totally driving a, a, a blank here. Uh, he talks about trans-individuation. Uh, and it's this notion that, okay, the self and it, the individuation of the self is a relational one. Individuation never occurs simply as an individual. It's more of an ecosystem of relationships and influences that brings us into being and that we in turn in part bring other beings into being as well by being present, right? So there's a kind of medicine bundle orientation here about the self that's very, very clear. Um, yeah, there, there's also, you know, a way in which this moves into a deeper philosophical or metaphysical question about what does it mean to be a self? And for those of you who are interested, I would recommend uh, uh, Kochia's work called, it's called Metamorphosis. And uh, I've bring, been bringing it up in my Patreon 
uh, and uh, talks recently in, in the recent fragments class. But uh, it's a, quite a wonderful book, but it has this kind of chimeral sense of what it means to be an individual being, which I think is just lovely. It's ecological. And I think in a very Gebserian sense with Gebser's work, a perspectival. Um, a perspectival was Gebser's term for uh, moving beyond that subject object relationship of, of modernity and the Renaissance, this, that, that sort of ego, egoifying subject object Cartesianism, right? Where we stand apart from space and measure it. The a perspectival is far more relational, more temporal. And then also it has these kind of strange transparencies where to be is to be in relation, right? As I write about in the article, to be is to be transparent, transparent to the chimeric, to the multiple. And becoming an individuation then becomes a, a relational activity as well. So identity shifts, uh, our, our relationship with space and time is shifting. And particularly the, the space part, I think is interesting to, to mention here too. And again, we only touched on this in very light details in that last piece. Uh, the space in the a perspective will turn in this new worldview is much more relational in the sense that scale is jumping and shifting and oscillating between near and far and big and small. It's very hard to make a kind of causal sequence with this sort of attitude. There's more of pattern recognition. There's more of configurations of relationships distributed across time and space that might be more poetically or better po poetically expressed than necessarily systematically. Uh, but it's that kind of relationship that we see. And I, I gave the example of Lynn Margulis is uh, uh, looking under the microscope. Uh, and, and to emphasize that in the article too, the microcosmic activities of these little organisms uh, in the microscope are entangled in these vast, large homeostatic processes of Gaia, right? So there's this entanglement of the big and the small, the near and the far, and these little temporal processes with these macro historical billion, multi-billion year processes of the regulation of Gaia, right? The growing of this sort of planetary patina that Margulis talks about. So that's a really good way to start thinking about what, what's the kind of space we inhabit if we don't inhabit the latitude and the longitude of the perspectival globe, uh, what's the kind of, how do we envision space in this new worldview? Uh, I think Margulis is a, is a wonderful place to start. Um, and then I think this is something I'll be talking about next month in, in the revisioning the history of consciousness uh, 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 talk. Um, this sense of, and the, the article as well, talking about time as the zigzag, uh, the, this sense that the way in which unfoldment occurs is also not something that occurs in, in a causal sequence. Uh, there's many ways in which the past is entangled with the future in a very nonlinear way, right? There's certain forms and morphologies in biology that I talk about in my class sometimes, uh, like the Nautilus shell and uh, uh, cephalopods, how you know the the exteriorized shell of these of these um, ancient squid and and octopi, these cephalopods uh, became interiorized and became a kind of bone or, or uh, uh, navigational uh, uh, structure, very bone like, and called the the gladfish, I think, in in squid or um, the gladius in squid. Uh, so there's a sense in which the bones of the ancestors become the bodies of the future, right? I, I want us to kind of think in this sort of stretching and folding and zigzaggy kind of way where past eras or epochs or cultural technologies, I'm thinking of traditional ecological knowledge, right? Indigenous knowledge being in relationship with land and place uh, in a more animistic orientation, uh, zigzag their way into the future and become relevant again and interesting and new admixtures with the modern. And the modern isn't necessarily the, the, um, uh, the, the bridge to this emergent future. It becomes much more relational and it needs to be in a kind of symbiosis with the many different cultural codes that have existed in our, in our beautiful history. So I'll be talking a bit more about that in, uh, in that essay, but, and in the presentation. So I don't want to, Let's take up too much more time. I know it's almost been 45 minutes or so. So maybe it would be a good moment to kind of open up the space, uh, get into some Q and A and, and see where we're all at. Um, and if there's totally adjacent questions about previous talks or, or writing, that would also be okay. I think if we're just in orbit around some of these questions, that would be great. So um, the way it works is just raise your hand if, if you know how to do that on Zoom and uh, we'll try to 
calling folks in relatively, ironically, linear order. And if you don't know how to work, how work that button, you can also just kind of wave and I'll keep an eye out for you. Yeah, Lisa, hi. Is it me? Yes. Okay. So, hi, nice to see you again. You we too. We did the GAPSA uh, class together long ago. Um, well, I didn't really follow all. I, I read a bit in your Substack, but uh, I'm like new uh, in a way, uh, but very interested, especially in this time um, uh, issue with GAPSA. And I just want to share a bit uh where I am at and and how I experience uh, I didn't I can't you 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 um, mentioned so many aspects so I of course I can can get can get to all of it but I recently listened to a, a Bonita Roy and she was talking about this time issue as well it's not long ago uh, this video. And she uh, she said this arrangement of of past and future, not like the linear, but like more um, here and there and everywhere uh, kind of of mode. And um, I think uh, as also about the the self you mentioned. I think the basic identification in the mental uh, area is like we go on a path from birth to to death, and actually it's a pretty depressed depressing because there is no afterlife in the in the mo modern view. But it's like I am on a path, and it leads me to all kinds of progress and interesting experiences. And uh, with all the complexity we um, are faced uh, in our world, I think what what made a switch in my in my mind was um, I'm I'm experiencing what we call all this information overflow might also be this um, change of of uh, incidents in time right it's not like the line it's not linear it's like it pops up from here and there and all this um, confusion many people experience might also have to do with this new arrangement of of past and future which is uh, normally called a, this info overflow right um and this this was very interesting for me because what what I do when I experience all this complexity, and this may also be uh, in line with uh, with Gaps's archaic uh, presence, is that I don't want to control all this anymore, but what pops up and comes into my presence, I'm dealing with. Uh, and of course, we have also uh, um, this ritual and and cyclic times uh, and and arrangements in our life, like the year and 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 Christmas and all kinds of stuff. And we also have linear uh, projects, uh, but it's not the general attitude to to uh, approach life and to see ourselves anymore. It's like a sub sub um, category that's practical for some uh, occasions, but not like I am on this path, but I'm more like I'm in the presence and all kinds of past and future um, things jump on me um, to, to say it a, a little bit. Um, yes, um, that's that's how I experience it. And and it would interest me if you could say anything about that and if this goes in is aligned with what you might uh, want to to tell us or, or, or teach us yeah that's great that's great i i uh i think that's a very good attitude that you you have towards the present i think um not to make it too much of a left brain thing but 
you know, there is so much information in the present to move more into that kind of relational right brain. I'm just sort of thinking or referencing the Gilchrist in this, in this moment. Um, you know, the, the present is always available to us as a kind of living relational space where it's not just knowledge and information that becomes available, it's relationships that become available. Uh, I think in order to really live in relationship with the present, it requires us to slow down. It requires a new, um, a new attitude towards the present, which is a very deep and personal one, right? It, 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 we need to be able to slow down enough to catch those kinds of relationships and to be informed on what we do in relation to them, right? Like I, my activity is informed by being able to slow down, being in relationship with the present and what is needed in the present, what arises in the present. So there's a kind of contemplative orientation here, but I think it's also very like beautifully philosophical. And I, again, I, I mention this book all the time, Byung Chul Han's short little essay, The Scent of Time, where he's bringing, bringing in Proust and Proust's relationship with time, that time needs a scent. We need to slow down enough to be able to catch the scent of time, whether it's a Madeline or something else. It's that senseful relationship with time in the present that enables us to, to flow and, and be in a kind of um, informed dynamic with with our present moment, right? To help us shift away from information overload, which I th think is very um, desensitizing. We, we, we are in a kind of mediated environment where there's hyperactivation constantly. Uh, we're not really in an environment as, as much as poetically some of us are, some of us artists are, like William Gibson, who wrote about this in Pattern Recognition. Um, there's, there's, there's not ever, everyone has that kind of experience with the information overflow, right? Uh, but I'm also thinking of Jamis's attitude in, in Dune, right? Uh, I think this is at least in, in the film version, right? That the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience it. Uh, it's a process that we have to understand, not by stopping it, but by moving with it, joining with it, flowing with it, right? There's this attitude of, of moving with the present, that I think is very much uh, Gibsarian themed. So I think you're you're definitely onto um, um, a very Gibsarian attitude here, just in terms of how to be with the present and how, when we are present, relationships start to bloom. Uh, what is alive in us, what is alive in relationship with us, starts to become a bit more clarified in a much more sensible way. And this might actually bring us away from some of the giant socio political questions and, and internet buzz and, and more towards kind of a daily activities or, or social relational activities in our particular, I use the term bioregion, but uh, I, I do think, you know, it does bring us back into those kinds of um, orientations and, and we need that right now. There needs to be kind of a radical temporix, a radical slowing down, uh, which allows for radicality, right? Relationality, the roots to, to come forward. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, great comment and great prompt to sort of dive into that a little bit more. Uh, let's go to uh, let's go to Faith. And let me also say, Faith, uh, before you jump in, uh, everyone's welcome to to type their questions in the chat or comments in the chat if they feel comfortable with that. I didn't mention that at the outset, but yeah. Okay. Hi, Faith. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, right. I hear you great. <laughs> I would have maybe typed my question then, but um. Uh, so, yeah, I was thinking a lot about, okay, I love everything that's being talked about with regards to future abilities and how that requires um, us exploring these uh, alternative um, models of time or consciousnesses of time and um, just how, um, like, the, like, I feel like that that would be an, such a relief from um, what I feel like is a poverty consciousness with regards to time, um, poverty of time consciousness that comes directly from, um, well, industrialization, right? Where like clocks started to, you know, to be used to, to um, coordinate like uh, trains, let's say, um, you know, and, and so it was very useful um, for that purpose. Um, and I feel like, Okay, so it's useful to, for a collaboration as we understand it. 
is is like to really be measuring time and to 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 be conscious of that all the time, and that's why it's under our consciousness. And so, like, if we are like exploring um, non, um, you know, other forms that aren't like this, um, how does co-creation happen? It, like, with, like, does it require a new idea of what collaboration is? Um, you know, like, is, is there anything that we can, uh, learn from all this, all, like, steps or everything that you mentioned in terms of sources? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, in, in some ways, I feel, I always feel unprepared to answer and then always feel ready to throw in my hat and say, we need that kind of orientation. Just, you're speaking of social collaboration. Uh, or, or how we kind of come yeah. together. Mm. Yeah, well, planetary consciousness, mm. I assume, involves action at, a, at some sort of collective level. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And so, um, like, some, like I'm, I'm not sure you're saying this, like, this, this strongly, but, like, uh, I, I feel like you're saying, and we can start with a different kind of time consciousness. Um, and I'm wondering like, well, maybe it's just, uh, we're not gonna give up clock time, I guess, but like just how it jives with um, clock time. And is there like a whole new sort of, like maybe even vaster way to co-create, I'm just gonna use that word, um, uh, that isn't reliant on clock time? Excellent question. Uh, I would just say yes, and there's different ways to answer it. Every Everything from, you know, transitional, let's say, economic and legal approaches that are attempting to kind of identify, um, you know, different forms of value, different forms of sovereignty, just at the sort of jur jurisprudence kind of level with, you know, common agreements about carbon emissions or, um, you know, rainforest protection, et cetera. There, there's that kind of level where there's, okay, we need to acknowledge the, the temporics of the bioregion as being important and, and usurping the importance of uh, GDP or extraction of resources, et cetera. So there's that kind of very practical level. But then I think, you know, there's, there's a bioregional timescale that, I think a lot of us can plug in and, and, and this is just a, a future ability, one of many, but, but one that I tend to like is, uh, I really appreciate Joe Brewer's work with bioregionalism. And, um, it's this idea, again, I think the principle of it is we are all kind of working towards, uh, localizing our, our activities towards bioregional regeneration, but then there's a kind of horizontal uh, scaling, right, or horizontal coordination that looks like multiple bioregions that are starting to kind of come online together and work in concert with one another. So there's this kind of growing down into the local localist and the present, but there's also this ability to kind of cross-reference, share notes, and be able to kind of coordinate collective activity at a larger scale. I think also, you know, uh, again, more more in the kind of mainstream macroeconomic question about labor, but the the democratization of labor, whatever that looks like, just in terms of um, unionization or or democratizing the workplace, et cetera, and having a bit more um, leverage and power just as a distributed sense and worker solidarity go a long way for, to, to kind of helping stem some of the more extractive hyper-capitalist kind of activities that we see today. So I, I, this is something I push back with, like, I don't think they do a bad job at it, but with Perspectiva, um, we were talking about, you know, the, um, the, making sure that we're advocating for free societies. And I think we also need to be advocating for democratized economies as well, right? The sense that, you know, labor will play a role in sort of mediating this planetary transition. Does that make sense? Uh, just in terms of the scale that we're talking about in terms yeah. of planetary scale, I think we have to go to the bioregion. There's a kind of counterintuitive move to, to the local as it plugs back into the global. Yeah, and I, I think I, I like that a lot. I mean, I, I feel like what you were talking about just um, at the end there was like the social issue of time equality, you know, just how right now it's socioeconomically kind of like some people have time and some people just don't, right? And um, and 
so the idea of going locally then makes it more possible because of the actual actual um spatial proximity um like kind of helping to to coordinate at that so the space becomes you know if you are working in that space then the time can be less sort of metric e and more you know kind of relationally determined and so that that makes sense like each locale maybe then has its own sort of timelines you know right um, exactly yeah but okay but the the general emphasis here just in, again more into the socioeconomic is is a uh, the localization of 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 our productivity of of labor of food and other resources of restoring watersheds etc um i think has has a kind of um there's a sort of radicality in, in the slowing down and saying like, okay, well, we, we're resilient and robust enough to be able to draw our resources locally and to do so in a sustainable way where we're not needing to have the kind of hyper-capitalist time of, of globalization where we get our uh, our meat, you know, grown in one, par- one area of the world, flown to another to be processed, then flown back, right? There's a sense of saying no to so many of the extractive Hyper capitalist time that I think is is a big part of this, which again is why like I, I think you know in our circles uh, we don't talk too much about labor and economy and it can be a little dry, but but I do think there's some radically transformative practices that are totally in line with you know again this is principle of being able to slow down and it's much more relational, it's much more ecological, but it's also radical in the sense of reclaiming time, reclaiming the present from clock time and from time as productivity or time as, as money, you know, it's to say no to that and to say yes to a different kind of time that still nourishes us and takes care of the bottom line subsistence needs, I think is, is one of the most interesting and more difficult places for cultural experimentation, just in terms of, okay, how did the new economy start working then? How, how can we encourage experimentations and radicality? How do we use the kind of, um, again, leverage the, the, the pathos of, of hyper-modernity, right? Of, of uh, hyper-productivity as, as a kind of negative universal to kind of go, yes, there's this negative, bad consciousness of time that we're all kind of laboring under that we need to em- emancipate ourselves from. Everyone experiences clock time in this sort of negative way. So how do we actually use that uh, as a sort of tool or energy towards transformation, right? There's a kind of there's a drive to get out of that. And I think we can work with that drive towards something that's more constructive and creative. Uh, but I think, again, it's going to require so much experimentation. And we're kind of, we're talking now at the kind of civilizational transition level where we're beginning to try to imagine how to live differently. And a lot of it has to do with like, yeah, just sort of a science fiction imagination too, right? Like what do these future societies look like that have a different relationship with time and still figured out how to feed people and et cetera. And, uh, yeah, we need to ha- uh, foster a space where that's all talked about and, and identified. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Faith. Great questions. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? I see some comments. Yeah. Carrie's saying, as a poet, I'm interested in what you said about how some of these things can be said more uh, sayable po- poetically than in other ways. Have you anything more to say about why that is? Ah, oh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think for me uh, personally, I've I've been always between the 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 academic, the humanities, and uh, the artistic and creative. Uh, I started out as doing lots of illustrations, and I was thinking about getting into art uh, as an adult and I and uh, creative fiction writing. But I moved towards philosophy and the humanities. Uh, so for me, like the poetic has always had just sort of a um, this sort of always haunted me in a good way, right? Like, because I found that um, there's just something about the poetic utterance or something about creativity, generally speaking, imagination uh, that is able to, without filter, transmit that kind of social complexity, the spontaneity of a new order, right? There's something profoundly um intensifying about the right kind of art, right? That instills a new subjectivity in us, a new attitude in us. And I love the connections historically uh, when even in modernity, there were breakthroughs in, in physics, right? That were kind of happening alongside these breakthroughs in art and perspective and like Picasso, for instance. And this is sort of Gebser's 
jam uh, in in ever present origin. He's looking at these these historical moments in the and particularly in the West uh, and in modernity where uh, the artist is 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 uh, helping to generate a new worldview, right? A generate a new subjectivity, but they're being generated by it too because they're sensitive enough to these these cultural transformations, but it can't be articulated in, a, in quite a systematic way. It can't exactly be formalized until a little bit later on when you know there's the right physicist and there's the right um, uh, economist, et cetera, that's sort of expressing a new cultural mentality in a different form. And even then it's non-reductive to that, right? There, there's something about the sort of um, inexhaustiveness of the creative expression of creative utterance. So I hope that kind of speaks to that and then I, I think I am always going back to uh, understanding our role. If, if we see ourselves as kind of transdisciplinary generalists, uh, our role is a bit like the artist in that, you know, like the artist, we have to develop a kind of sensitivity or we come with, we're born with this sort of sensitivity to these invisible transformations in the present. And like the artist who writes a poem about it or a, a painting or tells a story, um, we feel moved to somehow concretize that transformation to to render visible the invisible to some degree as the artist always does and our role is very much like the artist in this sense um i'm not getting this from myself this is very much what you know marshall McLuhan talked about with um evolution of media landscapes right he, he always talks about how the artist is a sort of early warning signal for the larger culture as it's undergoing some kind of transformation. I think, you know, our role in, in, in the larger culture is sort of similar to the artist in that way, and that we're, we're sensitive to something going on, this bigger cultural transformation that's largely invisible, it's distributed across everything going on around us. Again, a sort of background ontology. And like the artist, we're trying to bring, bring something, um, to bring it into sayable words, right, that uh, sufficiently express the attitude that we're feeling or the changes that we're, that we're sensing into. Um, at least that's how I understand what we're up to. Yeah. And then just Susan, before we jump to Marianne, uh, at the smaller collaborative group levels, one of the delightful impacts of uh, holding a wider sense of temporix is modeling our ability to shift frequencies and more overtly sense into the different qualities of time that are arising. Exactly, and this is what we're doing with the Gepser Labs and in the mutations community, generally speaking, what Susan's um, really been showcasing how we can formalize these into kinds of practices, right? How do we develop, for those of you who haven't dived into Gepser, you know, he has these particular structures of consciousness he's working with and articulating. How do we um, begin to familiarize ourselves with this round of, of different forms of time, right? These different sensible orientations with time in a way that we can really dynamically shift back and forth with them, identify them, and really flow with them. Uh, there's a kind of compositional um, sense that one gets as you really kind of do this work. So yeah, fantastic, Susan. Thank you. Uh, Marianne, would you like to jump in? Good to see you. Hi. Um this isn't a question, I just wanted to tell a little story that in a way speaks to the poetics of the land uh, and experience that I've had uh, on the east side of Glacier National Park, quite close to the Canadian border. And I should, I should acknowledge Bill Plotkin uh, and his work here, which um, Bill was the one that told me to pay attention, and it has been very, very fruitful. So last spring, uh, I, 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 here's the, the long and short of it. My left uh, brain skeptic is, is very upset by this, but I hear things, I hear words, I get messages in this place. So last spring, I was sitting meditatively at Two Medicine Lake, which is a uh, part of Glacier National Park. And what I heard were the words, see through the dimensions, which at the time I found, like, I had no cognitive understanding. And it's only this morning listening to what you've said today, Jeremy, that I start to realize that 
the, the wider context and a way of hearing those words. Um, so I share that from To Medicine Lake to all of you. Oh, thank you, Marianne. Wow. I have uh, chills a little bit. Speaking of rendering the visible, the invisible visible. Ooh. Yes, yes. Um, I think this is quite poetically as well, exactly what we're trying to do, right? Uh, this pointing into, and this is something Gepster talks about, that poetry is uh, is the history of the dateless. Um, there's a sense that events have occurred, but they haven't occurred in, in chronological time. There's a sort of dimensionality that's nevertheless there. There's a there there. And how do we speak of that there? How do we tell of it? Because it's not just something that's um, out of relationship with our present. It's it's a kind of invisible dark matter in a way or dark energy of the present, right? That is nevertheless involved in our worlding activities. And I think for us, uh, it's very much always this conundrum and paradox and, and, and a beautiful one of attempting to render those dimensions into, into the material without reducing them, right? There's a sense that it's always kind of, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of two theological concepts, right? The, 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 the Eastern Orthodox icon, right? There's a sort of bringing into material with the material paints, et cetera, the sacred, um, or in, in the Catholic imagination, right? There's a sacramental imagination, right? The, the, the object, the bread that becomes more than the bread, right? Or the wine that becomes more than the wine. There's a sense of sacramental imagination here that I think um, is very, very true for us as well. The sense of seeing through, uh, seeing through the world, what is presently going on. Um, these big, big transformations that are so difficult to talk about. Um, and then we live through across generations, right? Like um, Bill Thompson was so good at emphasizing that. The, the transformation from one cultural mentality into a new one uh, is something that takes place over hundreds of years. Many different artists and historians and philosophers and events that helped shape that transformation. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that necessarily happens in a lifetime. Although you might say like there's some quickening happening these days for sure. Um, it, it allows us to kind of both more appropriately respond to what is present and thereby strengthen it, quicken it, uh, embolden and intensify it, and then slow down enough to not kind of feel like the whole thing's on our shoulders, right? Um, which I think is, is, again, that kind of... Um, old attitude that we that no longer serves us in this present. Um, we can act towards the transformation of our society, et cetera, uh, without needing to kind of have this attitude of all of us figuring it out right now, uh, even though we, there's so much pressure to do that, right, in the clock time kind of way. Um, ironically, slowing down and being in relationship and, and finding the right kinds of relations to bring forward is going to be a quicker quote unquote path towards um, resiliency of these futures, right? Of, of future ability itself, than trying to systematically kind of figure it all out. Um, and then there's a sense, I think that Marianne's speaking to of just uh, the living a relationship with the invisible in the present, uh, which may not translate into talking about um, bioregional regenerative cultural practices, uh, Etc. But the, the fullness of what it means to be a human being, to be alive and be in relationship with the invisible as, as human beings have through art and through the sacred have, have always had the ability to do, right? And to fulfill in the way that we are accorded to fulfill it in our time. So anyway, great, great comments and questions. Uh, let's go to Tom. Hey, Tom. Good to see you too. Hey, Jeremy, I'm glad I happened to see this was happening and I have to read the article, but, uh, and I don't know what I'm going to ask you to do because you started to do it again just now, but there was something early on in this where you talked about being able to be in a, I just had this experience of being very much in a present that was completely open and there was no time constraint and there was no urgency, there was no feeling of what you were just talking about of, I have to do something about this now. 
And I just wonder what more you can say. I, I know Ria is on here and collective presencing is amazing. There, there's all these, but just more maybe about in the moment, in person practice to open up that perspective of, and I'm every person or origin, I'm sure is another good term for it, but how, <laughs> how to make oh. that into more present and as a basis for any bioregional or other action? Uh, beautiful question. Uh, again, one of the ones that's impossible to answer definitively, right? Um, yeah, I mean, how I've been finding it is is uh, I'm I'm spoiled a little bit because of where I'm situated with with my partner. We're in Vermont, and there's a history here of localism and small farms, long history of it. So a lot of the 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 food networks and and resources that I have here are uh, they're not bioregionally necessarily oriented, but uh, there are a lot of initiatives around here and. Uh, I, I feel a bit more connected with the kinds of food and the farm farmers that are growing it here and the land that it's growing on. Um, and this I'm, I'm recognizing is, is a kind of project that is not universally accessible, but I think we can, this when it comes to our practices in everyday life, uh, we can certainly learn to slow down a little bit. And I think one of the examples of doing this is, is actually gardening. Um, is growing food and paying special attention to the way in which time unfolds for the the non-human relations that we are watching to grow and participating in in the nurturing of right whether it's an indoor garden or outdoor garden I think gardening is a very contemplative practice especially if, if it involves foods and herbs that we eat um, you know any of us can really if we have the time, of course, uh, clock time bearing down on us as, as it always is. Um, but beginning to get a sense of what kind of, this is more of an animistic practice, but getting a sense of the kinds of food uh, that grows near us, just in terms of the herbs, in terms of medicinal ones, right? Like ones that really grow, that have a long history in the region that have, um, that maybe show up during particular seasons where there's, you know, I don't know, lots of head colds, right? Maybe there's respiratory herbs that show up, you know, that are available, really kind of getting those sorts of living connections with the earth around us and the world around us. Now, if we want to move that beyond and, and say like, okay, let's develop a kind of herbal plant medicine practice and um, animistic practices, that that would be, I think, one way of really bringing forth in, in Gepser's terms that the magic and the mythic along with the archaic, right? Uh, but I think just generally speaking, contemplative gardening, paying attention to time, paying attention to the food that we eat um, and the relationships that we are, we are engendering by eating anything, you know, whether it's from Aldi's or Walmart or the local farm, right? There, there's a sense of uh, relational consciousness that I think we can really begin to practice with our food, especially, um, and with the things that we grow, things that we eat, the things that we grow. Um, this is a very like Torin kind of answer, right? Like what, what's really, what's a really earthy temporix that you can start to get grounded in, in relationship with. Um, not all of us are going to have energy or time to get involved in you know, watershed activities or cleaning a river, et cetera. Um, but I, I think, you know, an awareness of that also is, is very helpful too. Um, even in an urban space, there, there's a consciousness of that and there's various initiatives and projects. Um, I've seen many from, you know, living, living in Florida to spending some time in, in Oakland and uh, knowing that there's a few waterways that make their way under the concrete um, that we can, we can help. So there's little things like that, I think really help us start to get resituated. Um, and then the other stuff is really hard to articulate. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, um, you know, just, uh, I do a lot of work with Tim Pork, So for me, I, I get to cheat in this way and I, I always need to teach it and host classes on this. And, and I'm also reading and writing about it. So I, I have a lot of prompts to, to reflect on the nature of how I'm embodying time and how time is embodying me. Uh, you know, deep time practices, I think are also really helpful here too, though. Um, if, if you have more of a sense of, uh, uh, you know, 
moving beyond the garden or in adjacent to the garden, I think getting familiar, um, yeah, Ramona saying deep time is in the garden, getting familiar again with the local wild uh, flora and its histories and the histories of the land uh, is also quite a, a good sort of at least educational experience. But uh, for me, living here in the in the in the Green Mountains, I've I've enjoyed this absolute fun deep dive into the geological history, the evolutionary history of the organisms that are here. Uh, I'm very enlivened by those kinds of inquiries. So I, I find a kind of yoga in in studying, you know, um, the first flowering creatures and how the Appalachian mountain range is connected to Scotland and, you know, the first forests were really growing around here. Right. Um, so that kind of history is very much alive in me. And I think it can live in us if we have the right kind of education with it and, and so on. So that all helps too. <laughs> um, but it, this might be very, very, very idiosyncratic depending on who you ask. And that's what comes out for me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks for that. I mean, I have this, I don't know when I will do it, maybe next summer of wanting to return to my genetic homeland of Scotland, but I, I I'm realizing I'm less interested in, in traveling and realizing that what you're saying right now, I have this amazing um, opportunity because of, of indigenous cultures who weren't destroyed here in New Mexico. And especially I have a connection with ACMA and I got to go to the feast day for the first time in three years because of COVID. Um, and my backyard is brutally hot. So I would have to build a structure to grow anything here, but I'm realizing the connections I've made locally are all with indigenous people. There's three sisters collective in Santa Fe and they're all based in, in um, growing <laughs> foods and so on the three sisters. And so that is one way I will kind of more deeply pursue, but thank you. That was, that was very helpful. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Tom. Uh, as, as Rosemary is saying, geology, history, land acknowledgement, and just throwing in gardening there, I think is, is, is great. And, and history could be our history, land history, um, evolutionary history. I think all of that really, again, and then engenders this sense of deep time, right. And a deep relationship with place in the present. Um, you can go quite as far with, with just doing that, um, and I would love to see this as more of kind of an educational initiative, right? Speaking of pedagogy, I think, you know, if, if um, newer generations, emergent generations were kind of raised in that sort of deep temporal context with their own sense of place, um, they might grow up to be a little bit different, uh, uh, enacting different practices. Uh, so I was going to mention something else about, about all this, but I think that's, that's a good place to answer that question and to leave it for now. So yeah, those are some little practices around slowing down, being in better relationship with the present and time and the more than human. Um, we can take those in, in much further directions in terms of animism, working with um, plants. And if, you know, if there's a kind of animistic relationship that you can develop with them, or even, a, you know, there's good science behind it as well. There's good Western science behind um, a lot of medicinal practices and such, but um, it really helps to uh, transform the landscape from a landscape to a an ecology of different beings that we are already in relationship with, and that different aspects of our own being in the world and embodiment um, are already in relationship with, right? Like in terms of our own health and well being, right? To really kind of work with the uh, the land as a kind of multitudinous, um, multi textured multi-enlivened interagency uh that's sort of the the aim here so that that kind of allowing that to kind of blossom in us um okay great let's jump to allison hello jeremy good to see you um i'm probably have shared this before but it seems like a good time to, to talk about the practice that i sit with a lot which is the body lives outside of time clock time and so the body doesn't live in the past or in the future. It lives in a biological now. And if we orient and we land in the, the actual sensate feel of our bodies, that will open into the mysteries of time that are not, that are in the realm of Kairos 
and no time and um and that's something that's immediately available i mean you you don't have to go gardening for this you can actually practice it right now on zoom you know you can sense your physicality and your body and that will slow down because it's bringing the energy down out of the head into the body and it's a slowing down process and then it opens out and um yeah so just just mentioning that as something that's always available yeah thank you Allison. that's great uh again i, I agree the the sense of uh, you don't need to garden, but you can certainly become very present with our animal body. Um, what is that Mary Oliver poem about the animal body? I can't quite recall the line, but um, there's a deep affirmation of it uh, through that poem. But uh, yes, there, there's, again, this is this is very Gibsarian language, but I mentioned the word already, senseful. Um, so much of this thematically is is in line with what Gups was talking about right this sense of uh the the new or the integral mutation or immersion consciousness um it is fundamentally return to sensefulness i i think uh there's a predisposition in the in the modern and in you know again using the language here with Gepser, uh, the jargon uh the mental structure uh, orients towards has a tendency towards abstraction uh has a tendency towards sort of you know experiencing the world a few layers a few inches above the ground and then a few layers of, of abstraction away and looking back at it um there's a standing apart and a looking back which even itself is a kind of embodied gesture but that experience of of desensitizing ourselves right is, is sort of has co-mingled with the history of the of the mental structure and the perspectival world the past few hundred years that we've been um living under and living through with clock time and globalization etc um and i think part of the the shift uh which makes this really interesting and again thematically about sort of return a very torn return to groundedness um or in in bruno latour's language a back to earth right a down to earth movement is that this new mutation or this reorientation of, of the of the integral is a return to sensefulness. It's a return back down to earth. It's a slowing down, right? It almost looks like reversal, and it is reversal in many ways. But to reverse is not to undo what we've we've accomplished. It's it's to to bring it back into relationship, right, with that that wider and wilder context, uh, the, the Cartesian mind has to be folded back into a relationship with the whole, not destroyed, not undone, but folded back in. And that folding back in is going to be by necessity, something emergent and new, because it's not going to be undone. Modernity is not going to completely disappear. And the achievement of, you know, standing apart from nature and abstraction and clock time and science and all of this, all these wonderful and terrible things that we've innovated in these past few hundred years needs to find a new relationship with the whole. But this is again why I like to shy away from stage models because there's this um, understandable but also uh, continuously problematic attitude, right? That it's just the next stage, right? And the one after the modern is the postmodern or the meta modern, right? But really it's this, it's this kind of overview effect and, and a, a turning back towards a relationship with the whole. And we see this, I think, in as a kind of meta pattern itself in, in, in nature. We see many different periods in Earth's history where there's a kind of promulgation of a new, a, a new organism and a new um, ability of a bioregion, let's say like the world's first forests, right? Um, creating all of this tree material, uh, which wasn't able to be broken down, right? Until fungus and other bacteria kind of figured out, figured out how to, how to do that. Right. So there's uh, you know, that's why we have the carboniferous period and we can go into the ground and dig up all of these fossilized bits of coal from ancient trees that they weren't broken down and composted yet, but nature found a way how to do it. Right. And the same thing with algae and photosynthesis, there was this wild destabilization and a restructuration of the world. Um, but now we can't really imagine Gaia and Earth without the world's forests and without uh, photosynthesizing organisms. So th there's this question of how do we, how are we going to integrate the strange activity of, of being human with the rest of uh, our Gaian homeostasis, right? We haven't quite figured that out yet. That's sort of an open question. But um, 
yeah, I'm just, this is a long-winded way, Allison, of saying sensefulness coming back down to earth um, and reversal and return as sort of the, the nature of this movement rather than a sort of an advancement into a higher level, right? Uh, I think all of these themes are very important and thematically coherent. Yeah. It, it, it brings back what um, Lisa mentioned at the beginning, which is this sense of things uh, coming to you. So what my experience has been over the years is that rather than trying to make something happen in the future, right, what happens now is that things uh, come to me and something then gestates and forms itself and then it's a kind of uh, interesting relationship with the past, what's appearing in the now and what what's emerging. So I think this sensefulness is really key um, uh, to uh, to what you're talking about. I mean, I can't imagine another way, actually, being somebody who tends to be up here. And same, you know, <laughs> I'm always having to read all of this theory and. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then, then you, could, you can drop down. <laughs> yeah. But it's okay to do that movement, you know, like I think for, especially as moderns, like we have to like give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and uh, well, it's movement. okay to fly off. It's, it's just important to come back down. You're like, yeah, it has to be a tether. There's usefulness in some of that efficient mental activity. I mean, uh, so it's not, I don't want to throw that out, but the senseful to me is the portal. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this is, I think the, the sort of unique voice that I think Gepser continues to offer in our spaces, uh, not the only voice, but uh, just as sort of one of these foundational thinkers that's been circulating in our communities quite a bit intergenerationally, uh, this, this senseful orientation, uh, I just don't find it as, as explicitly stated enough as I feel like it really needs to be today, especially with um, meta discourse and trying to solve the civilizational crisis and factor in all of the different dimensions and, um, you know, have our kind of top tier thousand mile high analysis looking down. Um, I, you know, that's part of it certainly, but it's, that's always the emphasis. I think we, we, we go towards as, as Timothy, Timothy Morton jokes, um, you know, modernity has always been anything you can do. I can do meta. Like there's this kind of move that's a very intuitive move and gesture for moderns to kind of go, okay, we need to go one level higher in order to kind of grasp everything going on. Um, that there, there's, there's an orthogonal move here. It, it looks like a return, um, but it also is a kind of folding into the whole. There's a wholeness and complexity there that isn't necessarily best described as, as a higher complexity, a higher level. Um, it's meta in the sense of metaxi. In, in terms of the etymology of that word being relational, right? It's through, above, beyond, under, over. There's a kind of um, multidimensional dance that the word and its etymology actually is, is, is um, connoting for us that I think is, gets lost a little bit. We, can, we tend to emphasize the higher rather than the relational and the prepositional um, um, overdetermination of the word, right? Meta. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's a plasticity in it that I think is, you know, pointing to and I'm pointing to here, the characteristic of this planetary mentality, plasticity and transparency. Um, anyway, great. Thank you, Allison. And thank you. Uh, somebody found the poem. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Rosemary, Wild Geese by Mary Oliver and Ramona quoted it. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Exactly. Uh, wonderful. Let's jump to Walter. And we got about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so to wrap up. So if you have questions, definitely jump in. Hey, Walter. Hello. Can you understand me? Hear me? Uh, just barely. I know, I know your audio is a little tricky sometimes. So just make sure to speak up. And I think we'll, we got you. Is it okay now? All right. Do they have problems? Uh, there's okay. there's kind of a background sound, but okay. then I will get my hit, my tone. I come again. I come again. Okay. Just okay. Please continue. Please continue. Great. Yeah, and if anyone else has questions about um, either the article series or Gepser or um, you know, since we're wrapping up to just uh, an inquiry around uh, 
what we might want to dive into for a future talk would also be great. You know, if there's something we wanted to really lean into, um, an area of questions or um, work with Gepser. For, for those of you who know, there's an annual Gepser course that's going to be starting come February and enrollment for that should be opening up soon. So if you are interested in sort of the the annual deep dive into Gene Gepser's work and ever present origin, uh, that's coming up. So uh, you might want to save your questions for that as well, if, if you're really looking to deep dive, but by all means, feel free to ask whatever here. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Danny. Hey, good to see you. Walter is ready. Okay, let's see. Uh, Walter, do you want to give it a try? Well, it sounds a little better already. Is it okay now? Oh, yes. That's it's great. Better? Much, much better. Just a moment. I'm a, it's too loud for me. Is it okay now? Perfect. Okay. Well, just a, a few remarks. Uh, the session is called uh, Living in a New Time. And uh, the, the quantity of information is for me always very difficult to first to understand and secondly to digest. But uh, it's also of course always very, very uh, exciting. It was just nearly 50 years ago when uh, Gebsa fall into my life uh, for the first time in the 1970s. And uh, it was a time when I started to teach at university students who wanted to become teachers for mental retarded and severely mental retarded and multiply handicapped persons. And with my uh, mental rational way of thinking, it was difficult to find approach to what in those days opened. And, uh, but I don't want to talk about that time. And now it nearly took 45 years. Gebser, I followed Gebser, Gebser accompanied me. And uh, I felt it's a living in a new time, but I couldn't understand. I couldn't catch it. Still, I, I can't well. So I want to tell you where I'm now, I just now in a very few sentences and remarks. And uh, what, me, what touches me mostly these days is that all what's going around us, also the, the climate discussion now again globally, next, next days that globally they will discuss again, is still a continuation of our mental, rational, deficient way of handling ourselves, our communication and the world. And there's not at any place, I feel, but at any place is a, a moment where the circle between earth and I say in my, in my way of thinking, heaven. I mean, heaven also in the way of climate, of planetary, but of course beyond, beyond the, what, is, what is beyond the rainbow. And uh, now I, what my what what me touches these days most is I feel I know I'm from Gapsa from your community from Jeremy this uh, transcending this mental rational way of living on this earth and in the community and to find this new uh, understanding of our in of an integral of an looking to a whole of connecting connecting things and that in this moment there are two dangerous there are two two dangerous moments the one is to give up the, the self as we do it nowadays is in a kind of self-destruction 
The other way is the task to transcend this mental, personal ego in a ego-free and in a uh, ego-free uh, mode and to find another self. And if this happens with all these um, attitudes, scapes, uh, uh, these tribes, if this happens, I was just reading again at the end of EPO, uh, page is 530 around, that um, when this would be possible, events and uh, phenomena will set themselves right. Something happens just beyond myself, without myself, at the same at the same time, through myself with me, and uh, not not. I, I don't know how to handle this life situation. How to to commu communicate it to a group like yours? How to catch things you are talking in this way. So, uh, living in a new time, HME, what, what is that point? Well, not point, but uh, is, how does, is it a, a new earth and a new heaven uh, being born through us and with the help of the Geistige, the spiritual, what is it? These are companies. Oh, Walter. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah. Um, fantastic question. I feel like it gets to the heart of, of Gepster's work and uh, to the sort of present challenge of my own work, a uh, theoretical and creative challenge of my own work, which is, um, you know, that there's laying the, some theoretical groundwork for next month and in, in my book, how do we have a, a time without progress? Uh, what, what's left? How do we really understand what's at work here in our own present and, and what has been, uh, what we have been working on with this whole strange thing called life and, and Gaia and, uh, the spiritual, right? Um, I, I think part of this is, it certainly is what you're speaking to, alluding to right at the end there with um, with help from the spiritual, with help from the spiritual principle origin as in Gepser's language, or sprung. Uh, he, he's very evasive with really pinning down what he means by that, but then uh, he he prov provides some very contemplative insight when he does. Uh, he describes it as the itself. And he speaks about, again, poetry being the history of the dateless here, that you know the, pro the spiritual processes that are at work in us and working through us um, are not just the human, not just human volition, right? That this is an activity of, of the spiritual and of the imagination as much as, as it is or perhaps more than it is the material and the historical, right? The material and historical is an expression of, of many more dimensions. Um, so there, there's a kind of mystery at work in here about what we're exactly participating in when we talk about this integral mutation or this transformation of human culture and consciousness. It's, it, yes, it has to do with the history of the human being, but there's also um, more than a, than a history of the human, there's a participation of the human in this larger mystery, this larger mystery of um, origin or the creative principle. Uh, and it seems to be, if we see it from that view, uh, a mystery that all of life is sharing and participating in, right? This, this creative principle of bringing forth all of these interesting and new forms and undergoing a kind of, a kind of perpetual way, metamorphosis, um, so that's what I'm drawn to as, as I hear you speaking. You know, I love how you framed it. There's this way of self-destruction. That's one way we can wrap up this story of, of the human in relation to the spiritual, right? There's this conclusion to our story of unfoldment where our transformation occurs in spite of us. 
And then there's this other story that I think many of us wish to enact, which is a transformation that we say yes to in turn, right? It's already saying yes to us. It's already moving us. There's already a volitional aspect here that goes beyond the human. Uh, when we turn towards what's already rising to meet us, that's when things get interesting and potentially transformative rather than destruction. It's the other path, right? It's, it's the other path you speak of. It's the path of to give oneself up to this, as you, I love the way you phrased it, to the other self, to, to find an other self. Um, there's this mystery of an other self that's in us. And I think it's you know very much this mystery of metamorphosis. Uh, we're always finding this principle, I think, in, in all living things. There's always an other self in us, whether it's the unborn or an ancestor. Um, and this, it goes very strange and far back, right? There's not just the human, right? There's the, the more than human, perhaps uh, both in the, into the far future and into the deep past. So the, the, the chimeric nature of the self is always sort of opening us up in this strange way. Um, so to find another self, right? And then the nature, it seems to be of, of nature is this ongoing transformation, right? Nature itself is this sort of... Um, I'm borrowing again from, from Kochi as he describes it as a cocoon for, for metamorphosis, right? Gaia as a cocoon for metamorphosis. And organisms, when we see them across time and space, are, are this kind of shifting morphing cocoon, right? A shifting of bodies, a shifting of relationships, a shifting of identities. The human being, if, if we are being invited to do anything right now, it's, it's having, or having the spiritual strength to turn towards that principle of creativity and metamorphosis and say yes to it, to it, and therefore yes to our own becoming other, our own becoming something new. And I think this is what our moment's really about. Um, you know, we, we see this principle throughout all of nature, but I think it's very interesting if we begin to view our own history as, as a history of metamorphosis, right? Uh, as, as plasticity and creativity, as unmaking, making and remaking of the self and of the world. Um, if that's our history, then we're saying yes to something, an intensification of something that's always been a part of us, has been there at the beginning and it's, it's here with us now. Um, and it's a creative principle. It's a, it's a, again, this principle of the imagination. Gepser says, you know, where, where creativity is pre present, there is origin, right? There is the spiritual. So we can take this work pretty profoundly far just in terms of what we're at, what we're at work here, but there's a creative spiritual principle that I think you're touching on and that I'm very much trying to articulate in, in, in the work right now. Does this make sense, Walter? I'm kind of getting at here. It was very good, and thank you very much, Jeremy. Hi. And to, to all of you, um, just these days where the the uh, Jewish uh, culture and the Muslim culture and Christian culture somehow too, and uh, others too, are so strongly fighting against each other. You know, they all are just... Uh, uh, move it in your mind. I, I, I don't. I'm not a missionary, it, not at all. Uh, all this is under this spiritual how say, roof. Or it's it's all connected, and we have to we have to talk about it, and we have to also if we don't have, can can't give answers. And just if you are interested, uh, I uh, already told already. Uh, um, Jeremy, and the, um, there is a, a, a movement in Egypt. It is called Sekem, S-E-K-E-E-M, Sekem, S-E-K-E-M. It's a, um, a movement uh, to agriculture and uh, uh, trying to create a new world. And it's based on the Islam and on this religion. At the same time, very close to Gabes, and they just in a very new publication one year ago, they, they uh, underline Gabes's idea of uh, changing our consciousness to the integral way of seeing the whole. Have a look in that. And it, 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 it encourages me. That's a very concrete, uh, 
real doing there, a big community based on the Islam, which I, Islam, uh, which I don't know uh, well. And uh, this uh, encourages me to, to go that way. You just uh, repeated Germany in a very good, good way. And I think we should at least again and again touch this point and not to do as if if when we change ourselves, yeah, something will, oh, the, the world will change and a little bit uh, bio, bio agriculture, a little bit uh, that and a little bit. It's not. We will destroy or people will destroy if they can't go into this other metamorphosis. I don't know how then the shape, our shape, our human being will look like. I don't know. Maybe you have the answer. I am very interested to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Fantastic share. And uh, yeah, just briefly, we'll jump to Danny in just a moment, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up for today after. But um, yeah, I think more than ever, we're talking about plasticity and this capacity to engage this creative spiritual principle to reimagine our world and reimagine ourselves to find an other self, right? As you as you wonderfully said. Um, we need this this characteristic more than ever today to, to do any of the things we've been talking about, to engage with a new time, to develop new social cultural practices in very grounded ways. Um, we need this plasticity of imagination and cultural experimentation in a practical way. That's like plasticity of our material, economic, social institutions, and then, but in the in the heart, right? That the poetic, spiritual heart of this is is this embracing of creative imagination, of embracing of the spiritual principle, um, the, to be a bit more intimate with the, as, as Gepser in his poem, Rose poem, I think, in the gentle diaphaneity of things, right? Uh, there, there's a sense in which that, that allows us to soften ourselves and, and be able to bring forth something new to engage with our own transformation. I think that's really the, the, the work that's at hand here. Um, I know we're at two, but uh, for those of you who can, let's just stay a little bit longer if we can, uh, or you know, if you got to jump, that's totally fine. The recording will be posted. Uh, but let's jump to Danny and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, everything you keep saying is just another way to say what I'm going to say, which is I, I was, um, you know, paying attention, sensing, you know, what was resonating and Marianne, who is no, who left the call, her, her moment, the voice of seeing through the dimensions. When I heard that, that felt different, right? It also felt like this is the way to, uh, to make contact with all that we're speaking of here. And, uh, and so what I wanted to add is, yes, see, th and, and there's a pause, we have to go slow here, right? See through the dimensions, listen through the dimensions, sense through the dimensions. And then I'm gonna say those three again, which is see in the dimension from that dimension. Uh, listen from that dimension, in that dimension. And then sense in that dimension, from that dimension, slowly, it feels like that's developing our capacity to go back to what, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure she, she's still here, but the, the informational overwhelm, right? It's our response to that. From which dimension am I going to experience that informational or inspirational overwhelm? I'm going to even say that, right? And that's all of that is Gepsarian, right? That's how Gepsarian allows allows us to move. And I guess I guess my point is I'm trying to say it's a practice to inhabit any of the dimensions, whether they're dimensions of time or space, to inhabit them for a moment and then move to another. 
something gets more digested when I do that in me. It's like, oh, that channel. So this is very beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Denny. Appreciate that closing practice as well. Uh, as we bow out for today, hopefully a little bit more sensible, a little bit more leaning in, seeing in, being in, being from. Uh, I appreciate you all. Thanks so much for attending today. And hopefully see you if you've got time next month for uh, the revisioning the history of consciousness. Uh, if you've got some time, definitely bring your notebooks for that one. <laughs> we'll see how far we can get with it. But all right. Take care, everybody. Talk soon.